Hey, this is Jared Krause, host of the Buying Online Businesses podcast. And in this episode, I'm talking with Mike Rhodes, who is the founder of websavvy.com.au, Agency Savvy, and he's also the author of The Ultimate Guide to Google Ads. In this podcast episode, Mike and I talk about what platforms you should be advertising on and why those platforms, why those particular platforms and how they actually stack up against each other and how you can use them as an ecosystem together as well. We also talk about what data we should actually be tracking when doing digital marketing and hot TP. And most people actually get too tactical and granular and don't actually optimize or track Uh, for this when they're doing digital marketing too. We also talk about how important ad creativity is and why creativity within our ads can be and often is more important than the actual targeting of ads, like who we actually target with our ads. We also talk about what percentage of budget we should be spending on ads and why we should be careful with this budget and how we should optimize to ensure that our ads are performing really, really well before we you know, go into budgeting and all that sort of stuff. And in this podcast episode, Mike has been very generous. And if you listen all the way to the end of this podcast episode, Mike's going to give you a free gift, which he used to sell for around $300. So stick around all the way to the end. If you are thinking about doing digital marketing for your online business, you're absolutely going to love this podcast episode. Now, before we get stuck in, I want to tell you that this podcast is not the only way that I can help you for free. I have my due diligence framework. It's a 2.0 version, which a lot of people have been raving about and hundreds of people have used this to look at and do due diligence on website businesses. It covers everything in website due diligence about how to buy a site, the questions you need to ask about the business to ensure that you understand the business and are conscious of the risks and what's involved with the business before you go away and buy a website business because I don't want you to go out and buy a lemon. So get this free resource at buyingonlinebusiness.com for just free resources. And there's some other awesome free resources on that page too. Check it out, guys. Let's get stuck in to this episode. Today's episode is brought to us by Niche Website Builders, which is a company a few of my clients are using and have used for content creation and link building services. They do everything from start to finish. So from keyword research all the way to uploading your completed article for you. We've also had Bob members buy ready-made affiliate sites built by Niche Website Builders. So if you're looking to outrank your competitors' content and build better backlinks, Niche Website Builders and I have a special deal for you. Head to nichewebsite.builders forward slash Bob. I'll put a link in the show notes for you. But again, that's www.nichewebsite.builders forward slash Bob. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Buying Online Businesses podcast. Today, super excited to talk to Mike Rhodes from Web Savvy. Mike, it's so great to have you here. We did the summit. It was a blast. We talked on and on about AI and marketing and Google ads. And after I was like, why haven't we had you on the podcast yet? Let's do this. <laughs> let's do thanks, this. Let's, thanks for coming let's on. Let's have the same conversation again, but different. Yeah, different, different angle. So thanks for coming on. Oh, pleasure to be here, mate. Thanks for inviting me on. So I just want to roll up our sleeves straight away and just get into the juicy stuff, which is what everybody comes here for. Now, a lot of people listening are just either about to buy a website business, they may own one, and there can be a big chunk of people with e-com businesses wanting to market their products. For somebody that doesn't really know like much about marketing, if they were to come to you at Web Savvy, what are some of the preliminary things that you kind of find out about their business and ask them uh, to work out what sort of strategy is going to work for their their business model or their even their brand? Like, is a platform that you look at where the audience is, how you want to communicate with that audience? What are some of those things that you you'd go through? I'm going to choose to answer that question in a slightly interesting way. I'm going to choose to start with a metaphor and then come into mindset and then sort of head towards strategy if that's all right with your permission. Yeah, great. It doesn't really matter what you say next. I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the way I've been describing Google Ads for many years is a metaphor I stole from the wonderful Dean Jackson, for me, one of the best marketers on the planet. And he talks about your marketing as a slot machine or as a vending machine. For most businesses, it's a slot machine. You chuck 10 grand in, you pull the handle in, you hope for the best. Google Ads done well 
turns your marketing into a vending machine. With a vending machine, you put your money in and you know what you're going to get when you press a button. You press that button, you get a Diet Coke. You press that button, you get a Mars bar. A well-run Google Ads account, you, you tip 10 grand in, you press the button and 50 grand comes out the bottom or 80 grand or 120 grand, depends on your market, your industry and how well you've got the machine set up. It is not a magic money machine. We need to be very, very clear. It doesn't work perfectly every time. It doesn't work for everybody. But for e-commerce particularly, I can't tell you the number of retailers, particularly when I go to the States, more so there than, than here in Australia, but they're all in on Facebook. And yeah. they might be spending, you know, 100, 200 grand a month on Facebook, but they've never tried Google Shopping. And it blows my mind because your, your prospects, your future customers, they don't go to Facebook to search out your physical product. Sure, you might have a wonderful ad and a great funnel. And when you bump into somebody new, it's well targeted. The pixel just knows who to show the ads to and they come in and buy. But there are thousands of people every day on Google searching for the stuff that you sell by name, by use, by the problem that they have. They're on Google searching and you can get in front of them and only pay if someone is interested enough to click on your ad. That's where I want to start. It's like, please, if you haven't tried it, give it a crack. It is just a tool. I'll give you another metaphor. It is just a tool, right? Fire is just a tool. Use it well. You can toast your marshmallows. Use it badly. It'll burn down your tent. People yeah. come to me all the time and say, yeah, no, we tried Google Ads three years ago. It was crap. Melted the credit card, spent five grand, got nothing for us. So-and-so dodgy agency whose name will not be mentioned um, ripped us off. Spent Which 20 one? Grand. There's thousands of them. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that is the problem, isn't it? I think the, the, uh, the small business minister is, is finally going to get something done about that. They're chatting at the moment about some sort of industry code. And uh, if anyone's that's listening right. that has any influence there, I'd love a seat at that table because I think I can add some value. But yeah, it, it, it should be about adding value to your prospects. It should be about showing the right ad to the right person at the right time and doing so profitably. And so let's then move into the mindset that you need to bring to the table if you want to build that vending machine for your business. You've got to have realistic expectations. You, know, you can't expect to be getting, if you're a lead gen business, you can't expect to be getting leads for 10 bucks if everybody else in your industry is happy to pay 250 bucks. That just, it isn't going to work. What you're going to be willing to pay the machine, and I'll refer to, to Google and Facebook as, as the machine because AI runs basically everything as we chatted about the other day. But if you are willing to say, oh, I want leads for 10 bucks and everybody else is willing to pay 250, obviously the machine isn't going to give you many leads. So realistic expectations, yeah. a mindset of experimentation. Now this thing isn't going to be profitable week one, probably not month one. And there's going to be ongoing work to keep it running well. This is the opposite of set and forget. It's not, not a YouTube, uh, a, a Yellow Pages ad that we write once a year and slap in the book and, and sit back and hope for the best. Because we got this fast feedback loop of we get to try stuff and we get data and we get to see what happens. Now, sometimes we kid ourselves that that data is accurate and perfect and it's usually not, but it is useful. And we get data back very quickly, which helps us adjust and change our strategy and our tactics and, and do more of the good and less of the bad. So it's incredibly useful that way. I love the, I love what you mentioned about so many people going on Facebook and, st and just starting with Facebook and staying with Facebook and heavily optimizing on Facebook and forgetting other platforms, especially Google, because what we have as when we come into business or we think, all right, everybody's on Facebook. Well, yeah, a lot of people are on Facebook, but who do you know that doesn't use Google to find an answer? And people don't go to Facebook to find an answer for anything. No, you bump into stuff there. Yes. You, you show off about your kids and your dog and your holidays and your mountain bikes. Um, it's supposed <laughs> to go to show off. And, and yeah. you, you don't talk about problems there. Like no, Nobody has ever talked about their credit card debt on Facebook. Yeah. But an awful lot of credit cards get sold via search ads on Google. Now, Amazon is obviously the other one. So a lot of people, again, particularly more so in the States than in Australia, but a lot of people will start their search on Amazon. I'm a Prime member, have been for years. And if I want to buy a microphone cable like I did this morning, mm. I will jump on Amazon and go search there. I might also search Google, but 
for some things I'll, I'll go straight to Amazon, but there's a ton of stuff. If I want a, a new kid's lunchbox or yeah, some video equipment for the room down there or so many other things, I will start on Google and I'll start searching there. I'll do some research. I'll refine my search mm-hmm. and eventually I'll end up buying. So particularly for retailers, I would say if you haven't tried Google shopping, please give it a try. It is just a fantastic channel for services, businesses, or lead generation websites, particularly for for the people listening to this particular podcast. You know, if you are selling a business, then what are you selling? You are selling the systems that your business is built on. And a huge part of that is the system to generate new business on demand. If you are buying a business, you want to know enough about this to be able to audit what the seller is telling you so that you can say, you know what, actually, yes, there is a really good vending machine behind this mm-hmm. business. That's what I'm really buying. And, and yes, some, there's some wonderful people and there's some great SOPs and there's maybe even a bit of goodwill, but this ability to generate new customers on demand in a scalable, repeatable, profitable way, that's really what you're looking to buy, right? Exactly, exactly right. And seeing that, all right, this business that I'm looking at buying has a Facebook system and they're in e-com, but they don't have a Google system. That is amazing value add for a business. And if you know how to run Google ads or you are going to get into knowing how to run Google ads, you can see these valuable opportunities within businesses that you're looking at purchasing. And if you're selling a business, you know, having those two main prongs covered rather than just one and and sitting on a one-legged stool, which isn't very comfortable and not very stable, you're going to be much more valuable in your business. And you have so much more data in your business, which is another thing that buyers are looking to buy. You've just got more options. And a lot of businesses had this realization a couple of weeks ago in Australia when when suddenly you couldn't post to your own blog and Facebook said, oh, no, sorry, we're arguing with the government at the moment. You just, you can't basically do anything. And for a short minute there, it looked like Google might even leave Australia too. That's when a lot of businesses realized, okay, I am a little bit vulnerable here. So, you know, having all of your eggs in a few different baskets is never a bad thing. Yeah, risk. I call it a risk minimization strategy is to have and not being what um, James Shramko talks about is a single source dependency on any traffic or, or revenue streams. And I've really find the ecosystem of running paid ads of being on Google for cold audience, bringing, bringing people in for exposure and then retargeting on Facebook is for my business and for a lot of other businesses, it's just a beautiful ecosystem. If you can run them, you know, run them side by side and build this ecosystem to make more sales. So let's expand on, on that thought. Cause that's a, that's a great jumping off point to actually answer the question that you actually asked me about channels, right? So within the yeah. Google system, just to sort of level the ground here so everybody understands what we're talking about. There's two main halves to the Google system. There's the search network and the display network. On the search network, us as customers, we're going to see those little text ads at the top of Google. And we're also going to see those square image ads with prices underneath. Those are shopping ads. So that's all on the search network, driven largely by keywords. So by what people search for and a bunch of other technicalities that we can get to if you want to. Then there's the display network, which covers about 2 million websites that have basically said, we want to make some money from our website. Hey, Google, we're going to put some of your code on our site. When somebody lands here, you figure out what ad to show them based on everything that you know about them, and we'll take some of the cash. And there's about a million apps, 2 million websites in that network. Of course, the most well-known sites within that network are Gmail and YouTube, which Google also happens to own. And because it owns them, it basically wants to sell ads against as many impressions as it possibly can. And you've got you know, a billion people, well over a billion people now a month using both of those platforms. And Google wants to show ads at the top of Gmail. And you've seen those ads on YouTube with that little skip button that you can't skip until five seconds, which is really annoying when the ad is badly targeted, but done well, like you're saying, remarketing, being reminded of that specific product that you put in the cart the other day, but you didn't quite get to buying because the kids came in and wanted to do their homeschooling. And we just, yep, had to go do that, being reminded of something that's actually relevant to you and useful isn't a bad strategy. So 
yeah, you can use it just for gold. So display, you know, banner ads, YouTube video ads, better to build rapport. You can use yeah. that for cold and or remarketing. But where most of our clients spend most of their budget is on the search and shopping side of things where in, it's, yeah, it, it, I suppose it is technically gold. You're potentially showing an ad there to someone that has never... What's the answer? Yeah, they've never yeah. heard you, liked you, saw you, trusted you before, but you're there at the moment that they're making that decision. They have a problem they want to solve and there's your ad. Great, let's go. Amazing, it's amazing. Now... You talked about, well, you mentioned twice, I think maybe even three times data. And this leads into my next question that I have for you is, is which, once we start, you know, experimenting on, on Facebook and then doing a bit on Google, whichever strategy is the best for that particular business model and, you know, industry and all that sort of stuff, then how do we look at the data? Like what data should we be looking at when we're running these ads and, what data should we be looking at to ensure we can even optimize these ads and, and test them, test other ads against those ones that we're already running? Yeah, great question. So the most important thing before you touch an ad account, before you run a single ad or spend a single dollar is to go, well, what do we actually want out of this? What do we want people to do when they come to our website? It sounds like such a stupid basic question. You know what your business objectives are, I would hope. You know what your business goals are. You build a website, you spent all of that money with that branding agency that made you a very pretty website. And then you got rid of that and you built another website that actually did something and, and made you some money. You did that because you know that the website is a really important part of the customer journey these days. And the vast majority of future customers are going to come through your website at, at some point, even if they're referred, even if it's word of mouth, they're going to sort of come and just check you out before mm. they fill in that contact form, before they give you a call. So the first thing is to figure out what do we actually want people to do when they come to our website? If you're a retailer, that's obviously much more obvious. We want them to buy our products. But there might also be some little goals along the way to that purchase, maybe adding products to the cart or adding products to a wish list, maybe signing up for your $20 off offer or your newsletter, all of that can be measured. And then we know that we're not just sending traffic to your website because you don't want traffic. No, we no, want no business owner in the world wants you want sales, you want revenue, better yet, you want profit. Yeah, you don't want sales that cost you a grand to make a $200 sale that isn't helping anybody unless you have an amazing business model with an incredible back end that I don't know about. But for most businesses, <laughs> making a $200 sale that costs a 1000 bucks is not good business. But we need to know our numbers. And I think in business, we kind of take that for granted, but many business owners look at their P&L monthly at best. Maybe worst case though, it's once a year with the accountant and the accountant tells them how much tax to pay. And it's, it's the first time they're looking at that chart of accounts. I would imagine your listeners are not in that boat. I hope not because we just recorded a podcast around accounting. But yeah. <laughs> It, it's a super important topic, but what are the objectives? What do we actually want to achieve by doing this? If it's a lead gen website, right? We want people to fill in that form or that form or call that phone number. Great. How will we know when people are doing that? So that's the data. What are we going to track? How are we going to track that? If you're listening to this and you're the business owner and you're wearing 12 hats, it should not be you trying to figure that shit out outsource that to your friendly geek, whoever built your website, your niece, whoever it is that looks after your website, tell them, I want to be able to track that, that, and that. Bonus points if you can add a value to that. And I don't like to use dollars with this. I like to call it play the points game. So if somebody like was to fill out that contact form, give it a number, let's call it 100 points. Compared to that, what's a phone call worth to you? Maybe 250 points because somebody who's calling me is hot to trot and I don't have to chase them back later on. Brilliant. Okay. Somebody signing up for your newsletter or oh, maybe five points. Anything else that you want people to do on the site? Oh, we'd love them to download this PDF over here. Okay. Compared to those other things, what do you reckon? Oh yeah, let's call that 10, maybe 15, no, 10 points. Right. Great. Is that everything? Yes. Brilliant. Right. Now geeks, go set that up, assign the points value to that different thing. And then we will know for every hundred dollars we tip in, how many points of value do we yep. create? I know we haven't generated dollars yet because it's a lead sitting in your inbox or it's somebody joining the newsletter that might buy two years from now and they haven't bought yet. That's why we call it points rather than economic value and, and putting a dollar sign in front of it. 
but now we've got something to measure against. And now we can compare Facebook to Google or campaign one versus campaign two or keyword one versus keyword two or product one versus product two. If we're a retailer, we get to compare these different things. The goal being, well, what's working well and what's not. Our yeah. job then, you mentioned optimization. Our job is then more of the good, less of the bad. It's that bloody simple. More of the good, less of the bad. When we just do that all day, every day. Yep. This is what I do in my mastermind is people come in and they go, all right, actually somebody emailed me last week. All right, this is what I want to, this big stack of lists of things they want to do to their business and the goals they want to achieve. I'm like, great. But to, to have all that sort of stuff, you need to really know what's working and what's not working. And, and that's so relevant in every every part of our business. And every I like part. that you, yeah, I like that you talked about not just the data and my my intention was to learn like what sort of data should we be looking at in Google ads or Facebook ads on the actual ads itself. But the, the real important data is like, how much does it cost for me to get somebody on the phone or how much does it cost for me to get somebody on my newsletter list or how much does it cost for me to get somebody to add something to a cart, which could be say 50 points. And then I know that, all right, the percentage of people that add something to cart, if I do some remarketing, there may be, 30% of those people will actually, or 40% of those people will actually purchase those products. Like that's more valuable data than just in how we optimize our ads and tweak them granularly in, Absolutely. in Google, and right? All data should be answering a question. So, I mean, we can dig really deep into Google Analytics and look at, say, the ratio of add to cart versus purchase for all of your products. And we might find, hey, this product over here, 25% of people add it to the cart, but almost nobody buys it. But this one over here, okay, only 10% are adding it to the cart, but almost all of those go on to purchase. That yeah. could be one of those magic ratios within your account. But you've got to ask the right question to go look for that particular piece of data. So let me flip it around. What most people do that ever log into Google Analytics and almost every website has got Google Analytics installed, which is a sister cousin to, to Google ads. It's, it's mainly where most of the data is stored and that's going through some changes that we don't need to talk about. <laughs> but most people have a Google Analytics account. A few people will log in, but what happens when they do is they log in and they start kind of like looking around going, I'm pretty sure there's some interesting stuff in here somewhere. I just need to wander around enough and I'll bump into it. Never, ever, ever, ever do that again. When you log into Google ads, or analytics, or data studio, which is the tool we use to, to create beautiful reports and dashboards, go into that armed with a bunch of questions that you want answers to. Which city are we getting the most return on our ad spend from the, the more specific that question, the better, and you'll probably have a few categories of questions. If you think about it, that's what you do when you look at your PL. You know, yeah, what's my top line for the month? What's my bottom line? What big changes have there been? What variants have there been month over month in marketing and promotions line item? Why did that suddenly spike to 20 grand last month? You're asking questions of the data all the time. The answers are there. You just got to ask the right question. And that's why for me, it starts with asking the right question about why do we even have a website? And what do we want people to do when they when they get here? And uh, that's that's brilliant. It really is. And a wrong question for everybody listening would be, most people may think this is a good question to be asking, but a wrong question to be asking is like, if I own an e-commerce business, what is my highest profit marginal, highest profit margin product? Let's try and sell that as much as we can. And then they'll create ads around optimizing that and they could burn a lot of money. And that, that's just not, you may make good profit margin, but it may not be the most popular. So a better question is like, what is the most popular one? And let's optimize for that. Give people what they want. The data is actually telling you that this is more popular. You may make a smaller profit margin, but if you sell more, it's going to be a lot easier and your business is it's going to make a lot more money. Quick story. I had a client come <laughs> to us. I won't name names. They're Australian. They might be listening. Came to us, I'm going to say like four or five years ago. And their ROAS, so return on ad spend, which is just simply total revenue divided by total ad cost. It's not a wonderful metric, but it's the metric that's inside of a Google ads account. So it's the easiest thing to use day to day. ROI, profit, lifetime value, much better metrics. Might be part of the conversation later on, but for now, ROAS is what we've got. Thanks, Google. So their ROAS was around about three, three and a half from memory. It's a long time ago, but it, it wasn't profitable. 
and they said, we need ROAS to be seven. That's what we need. So in other words, for every dollar you tip in, we need $7 coming back out of the machine. My team are incredible. And they got them a ROAS of seven and a half, eight within a few weeks. And then the client said, oh, well, that was easy. Oh, in that case, we want a ROAS of 13. Now, you might be nodding listening to this and going, well, that sounds reasonable if you can get $7 for every dollar you tip in, but that's profitable, remember. Why wouldn't 13 be a good thing? Great question. Because the total traffic that we're able to get and still get you $13 back for every dollar, picture an archery target. Before, everything that hit, every arrow that hit the archery target was $7 back for every dollar you tipped in. And all of a sudden you're saying, oh, hang on, no, nah, nah, you can only spend money if you hit the bullseye. It's this tiny little thing in the middle. It's much harder to hit. And it's much smaller than the archery target, which means in, there are so many less possible sales at that price. That led me on this journey of creating this, what used to be a conceptual tool, a, a thinking tool called the profit curve. Google actually now give us the data to build our own profit curves. And I've written a whole blog post about it. If you search for the Web Savvy blog, it's one of the recent blogs on there called Profit Curve. And it'll walk you through because we have so many, you know, that's the e-com story. On the lead gen side, we have so many clients that will come in and say, oh, we're getting leads at the moment for $80, but we need that to be $40. Well, well why? Do you really? <laughs> no. Now, is it because you're losing money at $80? Because if 80 is profitable, and, and maybe a break even is 200. You know, it's, it's actually really profitable at 80. You want 40 because you think cheaper is better. But, but if we could get you twice as many leads at 90, wouldn't that be better for your business? Wouldn't, shouldn't we be optimizing for total profit here? Yep. Not just how much did it cost to get them in the door the first day? Uh, this is where marketers really struggle is because they can become so fixated on the the little tactical things within an ad platform and, and changing ads this way. And like, if you're going to be paying $80 to get a lead, right. The people that you're targeting to get a $40 lead, you know, you may get like the likelihood is like you're targeting people that aren't that interested or don't have the same level of interest as the $80 lead. Or, or there's just a, a lot less of them because again, yeah. I'll go back to the machine analogy. If I'm offering the machine 40 bucks, but you're offering the machine 80 bucks, who's the machine going to give the traffic to? It's yeah, going I'll to give take, it to I'll you take the leads. Yeah. all day long. I might get a few just to, just to keep me interested, just to keep me paying some money to keep me in the game, but I won't know that I'm missing out on most of the traffic. And again, I'll come back to the beginning, right? Realistic expectations. If everybody else in your industry is willing to pay 100, then if you can only afford to pay 40, something's wrong with your business. Yeah. You need to work on, on the back end of the business and repeat sales, profitability, reduce costs. I'm not a fan of cost cutting to improve businesses, but how else can you add value? How could you charge more? How could you charge more for a second purchase? What can you bonus? Like there's so many other things that you can do there. I think it's Dan Kennedy that said, you know, the winner is not the business that can spend the least per lead. The winner is the business that can afford to spend the most. I love it. I absolutely love it. And it's worth it. Like I just think the more you spend, the more quality you're going to get if you have it optimized the right way, right? Like, yeah, like yeah. we said, like $80 to versus point. the $40. To, to a point. point. I mean, yeah, yeah. You, you could offer the machine 500 bucks and this is all explained in the Profit Curve blog, but you know, there, there comes a point where you can't actually get any more traffic because there are a certain number of people searching for that group of keywords every day. Maybe you can get loads of leads at 200. You increase that to 500. There's a few more leads. You could offer the machine five grand. It'll happily take your cash, but it's not going to get you any more leads. You've maybe shown a few less competitor ads. You're a lot you're poorer. Yeah. Because <laughs> Google will take your machine. If you're dumb enough to, to plug the wrong number in, Google's going to say, hey, got another one. And without dissing Google too much, there are parts of the system that are set up to, to guide you and nudge you in that direction so that you don't really look too closely at the numbers and the data that you started asking me about half an hour ago before this very long answer. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for that. I was going to ask about creativity and stuff like that, but I think mm. what we've already alluded to that people listening may not understand is that you can get super creative with your ads and there is a place for it. It's important. But if your targeting is, 
is really good. The creativity doesn't need to be like you don't need to spend. Well, like, is that like what's what's your um, I, thoughts on I that? I will often go the other way, frankly. I will oh, say wow. great targeting can't save a shitty offer, but a great offer doesn't need to be targeted that well to work. Ah, yes. So I think, you know, it swings around roundabouts. They both need to be passable, but the bit that gets the least attention is probably the creative side. A lot of people will, you, you mentioned cold traffic before, you know, Google Display. It's easy enough to, to throw together a banner, jump on Canva, you know, have one in five minutes, but creating a YouTube video, ooh, it's a bit harder. And so a lot of people don't try YouTube. Yeah. And if they do throw together a video, it's pretty nasty. <laughs> you know, a, a really good, a really well scripted, really well edited YouTube ad, like my mate Tom Breeze in the UK, I call him the Ogilvy of YouTube. I think he's just absolutely brilliant. He's amazing. His scripting and editing his team do are fantastic. And just his understanding of psychology and behavioral economics is brilliant. They really stand out. And he's found for him that the best length of an ad is about two minutes, 20 seconds. Yeah. It's not a 15 second TVC that's like, oh yeah, we've got this TV ad. Let's just chuck it on YouTube and hope for the best. They yeah. are crafted two minute long bits of theater, frankly, you know, some of them, they're just amazing. And that won't need to be targeted within an inch of its life because it's such good creative. I mean, yes, we will still test a whole bunch of different targets, but best targeting in the world probably isn't going to save a really crap offer. Yeah, I've been through some of Tom Breeze's stuff and you actually introduced me to Tom um, oh, cool. through one of the one of the recordings that you you did uh, with Tom. It went for about two hours and it was just absolutely amazing talking about his Educate funnel. Yeah. And even just looking at some of the clients he's worked with, just the creativity on their ads is cinema. And because the timing is like they've they've worked out a lot with comedy how, and the yeah. edits and it's yeah. just yeah. There's and a every lot market's different, you know. Not not every business can can run a comedy ad. And for every Potpourri ad or Harmon Brothers ad, there's probably 10,000 crappy ones that we never yeah. get to see. You know, those are the ones that get put up on the big stage and everybody celebrates them or Dollar Shave Club. Yeah. You remember yeah. when that was like, oh my God, they were the first people to do a, an ad like that and it just went ballistic, Old Spice then. Those are few and far between. And it's, I'm not a creative guy at all I, I would never come up with the ideas for that stuff but you, you just intuitively know good stuff when you see it yeah but if I had I, I guess I've never really thought of it this way but you know what's the um, Abraham Lincoln quote if I had six hours to chop down a tree I'd spend the first five hours sharpening my axe I'm sure yeah. I balls that up but it's roughly that if I had a budget of 50 grand you probably should be spending at, at least half of that I don't know Agreed. if it's 40, 45 grand on, on creative and not just on ads because you could spend 50 grand running a really bad ad and you're probably going to do your dough. I like that. I like that a lot because people will come into this like, oh, digital marketing, I, I need to really be good at Facebook ads. I need to know my Google ads and I need to know how to you know, set them up well. And yes, you really do. But like you're saying, sharpening that axe and that creative, I'm, I'm glad that I brought that up because I was just going to skim over this. And I'm learning so much about creative myself with with my own ads that if I do produce better quality, it's going to entertain people and it's going to stick more. Mm. And that's what these bigger brands do with like jingles and like this is older marketing, but it sticks and that's important that those little things you do with psychology and humor. Again, and, you can't measure it necessarily, right? Like we yeah. were saying before, like it's hard. There's, there's a certain amount of faith in there that if I invest in my brand, I'll tell you what, a book that really changed my thinking on that, having been a direct response guy for the best part of 20 years now, was um, Rory Sutherland. The book is called Alchemy. It's wonderful on Audible because he reads it. And he's, he is just what you would picture as old school ad guy, G&T in hand. I swear you can hear the, the ice cubes clinking on some of the recordings. <laughs> he actually had a course that Tom put me onto and he, he stops like two minutes into the very first module and goes, oh, we'll have to pause the video here. My G&T just arrived. <laughs> and then like cut and it starts again and he's sitting there looking much happier with this glass in hand and he carries on with teaching the course. He's a wonderful guy. He's the, the co-chairman of Ogilvy UK, I believe. But he changed the way I think about brand because I've always been sort of quite anti-brand and all about performance. And there's so many lines in there. There's so many good bits. But even just this idea of 
a great brand just shows people that you are willing to invest in yourself and therefore they should as well. You know, you are here for the long game. You, you're not some fly by night outfit. You believe in yourself, you're investing in it. Therefore it's safer for them to as well. And I, oh my God. Yeah. Okay. So good to bring that into the episode because people that are listening to this, a lot of people will come from the position that I have of like, I want to get online to make money online so I can have a better lifestyle and we'll just scrap it together however we can. And as we start to evolve, some people can still continue on that route of like, I'm just going to try and put my e-commerce brand together and get a cheap logo done and just, you know, get a cheap website done and, and really try to do this whole thing on a shoestring. Yeah. And I think right now, more than ever, as we record this in 2021, it's so vital that we do invest in our businesses to build our brand, to really stand out from the crowd, like you said. And, and it's always a dichotomy, right? Jocko Wilnick, you know, big, scary Navy SEAL dude that you yeah. never want to meet in a bad alley, in a, in a dark alley, unless you're on his side, in which case you're winning. Um, <laughs> but he has this wonderful book about all of these dichotomies. Everything in business really is a dichotomy. I'm a massive, massive fan of the 80 20 approach of start scrappy and lean and hungry. But yeah, you got to balance that you reach a point where you have to go invest in a faster site or a better logo and not spend a stupid amount of money on that stuff at the beginning. I remember my very first business in Australia, I spent something like 850 bucks on a logo and I was like, Oh my god, how can it cost this much? <laughs> it's, it's just a few pixels. This is a ridiculous amount of money. Now I'd be happy to pay for that. I think the last time we uh, refreshed Web Savvy, it cost me 15 grand. There I've comes a there point where you that. involve yeah. and, and you invest in that stuff. And, and the game is balancing that of, of where do I invest now and, and where can I stay lean and scrappy? And there's some things that you, it, the order of that, the timing of that is important. And that's where it's good to, yeah, join a mastermind, get some other perspective mm. on this from people around you. But please don't make that mistake of go drop 200 grand on, on the website and the branding and the do people still do letterheads anymore, but letterheads and, and all of that stuff and then have no money left over to market the bloody thing. Cause if you yeah. build it, they won't come. You've got no. to go spend some money to get in front of them and you've got to allow for that in your business plan. Yeah. And even if you did have money for marketing left over you and you spend all this other money on branding is you need to have proof of concept. Like we talked about before, when you buy a yeah. business, you're buying a system that's working really, really well. Get your proof of concept first and then put in a branding. Another thought pops up here for me of, of theory of constraints. So picturing your business as a, as a pipe. And if this part of the pipe is squeezed thin and this part over here is squeezed a little bit, there is absolutely no point in me spending any energy on this bit that's squeezed a little bit. And for many businesses, that's your brand. You know, yep. it, it's okay, it's good enough, but it is not the constraint in your business. But this bit over here that's squeezed thin, until I widen that part of the pipe, there's no point in me spending money, time, effort anywhere else in my business because this is blocking everything else. I can, I can move up the pipe here. This bit's fine. I can spend a ton of time and effort making this part of the pipe really fat. Doesn't matter for shit if this part of the pipe here is still squeezed thin. All my effort right now should be on that. So that's the sort of the judgment call, I guess, of what's the next most important thing to invest in. Is that team? Is that training? Is it hiring? Is it our systems? Is it the brand? It's probably not the logo and the letterhead. There's a lot to a business. Now, I want to come back to the marketing. One sort of thing that I want to speak about is ad budget. Now, we talked about me doing some cold on Google and then retargeting on Facebook and having this whole ecosystem between them all. And we talked about, all right, let's, let's optimize towards getting points for leads or calls or whatever. And then we can remarket and all that sort of stuff. What are you roughly doing in your agency or what do you roughly see as an, as changes from industry to industry and, and business model to business model. But like, what do you see that works really well with the amount of cold budget versus in remarketing? Are you seeing like 20% on cold and the most on remarketing? Or what do you t tend to see and feel that works I, well? I think about budgets very differently from someone that does a lot of Facebook ads. Because on the Google side of things, I'm far more focused on outcomes. So whether that's my CPA, if I'm a lead gen website or my ROAS, 
I might be using a different metric in terms of profitability, but let's keep things simple and say ROAS or e-com. You've got to be very, very careful inside of Google because they are going to nudge you to use a lot of their AI tools. Some of them are great, some of them not so much. In particular, bidding models. Let's start there because I, I always think of, I'll, I'll explain Google ads in 10 seconds to you. Picture a pyramid. It's got three levels. The base of the pyramid is bidding. In the middle, we have targeting. And at the top, we have messaging. And the computers are coming, the robots are coming up from the bottom. And the whole thing's built on data. So we've got basically three main levers, bidding, targeting, messaging. The whole thing's built on data. So bidding is the first thing that, that Google are going to tell you, leave it to us. Like it's just too complicated for you poor little humans to understand. Leave it to us. Now, there's two main classes of bid model that they have without getting into all the technicalities, but target CPA, target ROAS, that says focus on my outcome. That's what we use a lot. Maximize conversions or maximize revenue, they call it conversion value, that cares about your budget. And it basically feels it's failed. It, it's not going to go to the Christmas office party at Google if it doesn't spend all of your money every single day. And if you set a budget of a thousand bucks, it doesn't really care what the cost of those conversions are because you just told it maximize conversions and spend a thousand bucks a day. If you give a teenager a credit card and say, right now going off to the shops, but you can't spend more than a thousand bucks a day, how much do you reckon the teenager is going to spend with your credit card? I reckon they're bucks. going to spend all of it. Yeah. <laughs> Google's kind of the same way. If you say, look, you can only spend up to a thousand bucks a day, it's going to be very literal around that. And you said, oh, by the way, also maximize the number of conversions. Well, I could only get you two oh, sorry, did, did you need them to be 50 bucks each? Well, you didn't tell me that. You said, mm. get as many as you can get and don't spend more than a thousand bucks a day. If you use target CPA and target ROAS, in other words, focus on outcomes, then you don't really need to be too worried about your budget. Now that may sound a bit scary, particularly if you have a Facebook mindset or an old school marketing mindset where you, we used to have a pie chart, spend this much on TV, spend this much on radio, spend this much on these ads. I've never had that mindset because I was never in ad agency world. I was never a trained marketer. I came to this as more of a scientist, mathematician, engineer who loved, I used to do options trading and, you know, a love of numbers. So this made intuitive sense to me. Now, if I'm tipping in a dollar and getting $7 back, why do I want to limit the number of dollars I'm tipping in? If I can do that, I'm going to keep spending money all day and twice on Sunday. Like, let's go again. Let's go again. Now, the more you spend, that will start to decrease because obviously the first 10 grand you spend should be, if you're doing it right, much more profitable than the 10th lot of 10 grand, which should be more profitable than the 30th lot of 10 grand. So diminishing returns and our job as, as marketers and as an agency is advising our clients on, on where to stop. I know you think you want to spend 200 grand this month, but, but actually I think that last 50 grand would be a complete waste of money let's wind that back to 150. Or if those numbers are too scary for you, the difference between two grand and 10 grand. Yeah. But what's going to get you the return that you want, which comes all the way back to what we started with of what's it worth in your business? How much is a lead worth to you? What's the maximum amount you would cheerfully pay for a lead? Like you've got to understand the concept of break even. And what's your break even cost, either cost per lead or cost of selling these things through my e-com store. That's easier and obvious, right? I know what my cost of goods are. I know what my overhead are. It's, it's much easier. I know I need to get at least three to one return to break even. On the lead gen side, it's often a bit more fuzzy. But I come at it that way of as long as there are no other constraints in your business, that could be a cash flow constraint. It could be one of my favorite stories, a client in Adelaide many, many years ago when I was just getting started with this agency. We turned on Google ads for him. I met him through a radio gig that I was speaking at. He, spending a fortune on radio ads. We turned on Google ads for him and I got a call from him a few weeks later. Mate, I don't know what you're doing, but could you slow it down a bit, please? Because the boys on the factory floor can't keep up. Yes. <laughs> Done your job. Done your job. Loved hearing that. And that's yeah. what I love about Google ads to this day. It is, I can just wind the dial down. I can, I can turn the tap down and, and send a bit less traffic and it should be more profitable when I do that. Or I can wind it up. You know, back Friday last year, we had a couple of clients that went, you know what? You've done a great job all year. We've had a shit year, but you've made, kept us profitable. Let's give it a nudge. Let's, let's see how much we can spend, even if the last little bit isn't profitable. Let's, let's wind that tap up just to see how, how far it can go. So as long as there isn't another constraint in the business, then you should spend as much as you can profitably spend. Or unless, unless the, one of those constraints might be, could you spend it more profitably elsewhere? 
is there something else that you can go do and go and tip this money into creative more profit like creative like yeah. yeah take that last 10 grand and tip it into creative or tip it into other area or staff training or just thanking everybody for making it through a crap year and, and chucking a big party. That might be a better use of that 10 grand than going from 120 grand to 130 grand on your budget. Oh yeah, for sure. That's definitely good money spent on, on team and culture. Almost always, right? Uh, yeah. Almost always. So Mike, absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. I love that you, you talked about it differently. You talked about, what I asked, you gave different answers that most people would give. And I'm sure everybody else really, really appreciate it as much as I did, uh, especially what budget should you put into cold and remarketing and, and really understanding that, Hey, like, let's, let's look at it from a view of what makes sense with my return on investment. And you got to test, right? So yeah, you I, test mean, it. The, the, I, I can hear a couple of people yelling at me right now saying, yeah, that's all fun and games. If you know you're getting $7 back, but I don't know that yet. So what should my budget be? Avinash Kaushik, who's Google's digital evangelist, has this 70-20-10 approach. So you should be tipping 70% of your budget into known stuff, stuff that you know is going to get a return or is very likely to. Because when you start mm. out, you don't know, but that's where having a, I know it sounds incredibly self-serving, but having a good agency in your corner who can bring some expertise to the table, some experience to say, look, just don't go there. Like not that channel or not those keywords, but, but start here. This is the most likely to be profitable. Yeah. 20% then is your sort of experimental and then 10% is your weird, wacky, crazy stuff that, you know, like, okay, let's, let's assign a little bit of budget and go test that weird stuff. But 70% should be on on the knowns. So I don't think about it in terms of a percentage of cold or a percentage of... We had a client recently, I won't mention names, who insisted that for their brand campaign that that should be 7% of the overall spend because that <laughs> had, that's what the number was in a previous business where he'd worked. And I never really understood the mindset of that because surely that depends on what you're spending in all the other buckets, right? It depends on what you're spending in search and remarketing and are you investing in YouTube? Maybe they were investing heavily in YouTube and spending more there. This particular brand isn't because we don't have the creative yet. So why should it be 7% of some arbitrary total number if it's making money for you? Let's test around it. Let's test what happens if we double budget on that brand. Let's test what happens if we turn it off for a month. Sure, you know, let's try a few different things. But I, th I find those sort of arbitrary rules to be very arbitrary and, and usually have come from somewhere else that, like digging into why that number can often be painful, but it's usually worth doing. Yeah, we need to be able to be a paradigm shifter for sure. And that keyword that you mentioned is is testing. That's what that's what marketing is. It's just a big test. That's why scientists and testing. engineers like yourself do it so well. Where can people find out more about Web Savvy and yourself and what you guys are doing? Well, probably the best place to start is I released a course last year that we recorded in lockdown. Uh, it's about 40 videos and we sold that for 300 bucks, but we've just recently put the entire course online for free. So we've Amazing. turned that into a super massive blog post. We've got all of the videos and even all of the audio. So you can listen to it as a podcast if you prefer audio. The easiest way to find all of that, so it's our Google Ads Fundamentals course. So GAF, GAFcourse.com. So GAFcourse.com, go there. You don't have to opt in. I think you can get like a nice, beautiful PDF if you opt in. You can find the videos, find all the text there. It's all there. That's the easiest way. And if you like that, then I'm sure you'll figure out a way to get in touch with us and ask us what else we can do. Thank you so much, Mike. So gafcourse.com. Guys, check that's it out. Cool. I'll put a link in the show notes. Thanks so much for coming on, Mike. And that's it for this episode, guys. Now, before you go, I want you to think of two to three people who either have a business or looking to get a business, an online business, and do some marketing. Think of those two to the three people and send them this podcast episode so they can learn some pretty key things that we talked about in this episode. You'll be doing them not, not just a massive favor to themselves, but yes, selfishly, you'll be helping people discover our podcast too. So please share this episode with them. That's it, guys, and I'll speak to you on the next one. Bye.